Hello, and welcome to everyone. We are happy that you, you guys can join us this month to Wishin's webinar, Energy for Water from Sun and Co. So joining us today for this webinar, we have a terrific panel. We have Lucy Pia Pluschka from GIZ in Germany. She's with Powering Agriculture. We also have Pooja Sharma from Practical Action in Nepal. And we have Jorge Ayarsa from Min Bayou in India. We'll also have Willington Ortiz, who's from Visions at the Wuppertal Institute in Germany. So if you guys have been following us, uh, remember that we definitely will welcome your questions. So do let us know what those questions are in the chat bar that you can see on the right side. And please let us know who those questions are directed to when you send them through, as this will help us guide them uh, during the discussion time. And we'll sure have those questions answered for you. So we also want to remind you that at the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey that we'd like for you guys to provide us some feedback uh, regarding the content or any technicalities uh, or probably perhaps what you like to see in the future. So just to get us started here, we'll begin by doing a couple of polls. I uh, will have them throughout the webinar here. This first one uh, that should be coming up shortly, um, it's just gonna provide us with some information. This is to promote interactivity between us. So we'd like to know from which global regions you are located in today. We know we have people from different parts of the world, so we'll get you guys here setting in your answers. We'll be, short, we'll be closing this poll shortly to see where you guys are coming from. We know in the Americas is quite early, but Hopefully we get, we have some of you guys here. All right, so now we're closing that poll and we'll see where you guys are located. Yeah, so we have a few people from the Americas. Good morning to all of you guys. We have quite a few people from South Asia, so glad that they can definitely join us as well. We have uh, some people from Europe and Africa as well, so we welcome everybody. Have a nice dynamic here. All right, so we'll close this poll here and we'll open up this next uh, poll. And we'd like to know where where your background is from. So, you know, we have quite different people from nonprofit sectors, from the private sector, we have from government, academia, and perhaps other fields. So we just like to know um, what that background is just so the panelists can have a better idea of who they're going to be speaking to this um, today. So we'll be closing that poll here shortly as well. We'll give you a few more seconds to submit your answers. All right, so we'll close this poll and we'll have the answers. All right, so we have quite a few people from the nonprofit sector uh, and also from the private sector. But we do have some government academia as well as others joining us. So thank you so much. We can close this poll now. So thank you again for joining us. This uh, is a great topic uh, that we're gonna be integrating. Um, we're going to move on to Willington Ortiz, who's gonna give us a little bit of information on um, why we're having this uh, topic for today for Wishes. A webinar, so we'll turn it over to Wellington. Yes, hello everybody. Um, uh, you can hear me very well now? Yes. Yeah, okay, Jess, thank you very much. Welcome to everybody. Uh, we, the Visions team, are very happy to see your interest on the proposed topic. And thank you for our for the speakers, uh, 
for accepting our invitation. My name is Willington Ortiz. I'm research associate at the Wuppertal Institute and part of the Visions team. I would like to say only a few words about Visions perspective and, and motivation to um, to this uh, to this topic. We are we will um, we will talk today. Oh, I just see that my yeah now. Um, 15 years ago, when Wishons was launched, uh, the idea that small decentralized renewable energy technologies are appropriate for, for addressing energy marginalization or energy poverty was mainly regarded as a very unrealistic utopia, let's say. And since then, there have been amazing developments in technology, in implementation models, in business, in policies. So today, it is widely recognized that decentralized energy technologies, decentralized renewable energy technologies, are crucial for dealing with um, what today we call the Sustainable Development Goals 7. So from our perspective, the main one of the main challenges now uh, is how to ensure that improvement in access to energy effectively tra uh, translate into sustainable development options for people. And it is more on how to deploy the great technological potentials we have now. Um, and visions, in Visions, we have learned that three principles or aspects can significantly help in, in making this real, in making these uh, development options real. And I, we won't just want to mention them. The first is that the technical applications should be focusing on people's livelihoods, or in other words, that the focus should be in the actual needs or specific uh, aspects of daily life that can make change uh, for people. Uh, and secondly, it is important to recognize and support local actors as agents of change. Uh, this is uh, that they are part and key actors of transformation processes rather than seeing them as beneficiaries at the end of a long causal chain. And finally, we have learned that deployment efforts should consider the multiple aspects of, of local context and, and broader conditions that play a role in enabling but also in hindering human development. And the case or the deployment of, of renewable energies for attending water demands of, of small agriculture is definitively an application filled with great potentials for really enabling sustainable development of farming uh, families in the global south. So, for example, in the, in the, on the technical dimension, it offers the possibility to take advantages of the local available renewable energy resources in order to improve access to water for agriculture. However, uh, there is a lot more to be considered. For um, taking the, the example or the concept of sustainability of livelihoods, sustainable livelihoods, one would uh, need to think, for example, on social aspects like uh, local organization practices or the actual configuration of local markets for technology and for, for food value chains, for example. But also uh, it is important to produce locally applicable knowledge on, on these technologies, but it is also important to have consider the sustainable uh, no, the suitable finance mechanism, for example. And this multidimensionality of the challenges is very well illustrated by the experiences that our speakers will share with us today. So I'm very, very happy about this opportunity to learn from them how renewable energy based irrigation can make really a difference for many people in, in the global south. And I'm, I'm very looking forward for, for the discussions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Willington, for that intro to the webinar. Um, and so with that, we're gonna be going um, to our first presentation, um, who will be giving us a better idea of, of what she's been doing with the different applications within solar irrigation. This is Ms. Lucy Pia Plushka. So I am turning it over to you so we can hear more about the topic. Good. Hello, everyone. Um, so I believe you can see my screen now. Um, 
Does it work? Yes, it does. Okay, good. Then I'll start. So I'm Lucy Ploschke. I am actually based in Nairobi in Kenya, uh, where in we're working all over East Africa on different topics, but one of them is solar powered irrigation. Um, before that, for the past well, five, five years, six years, I've been also working on the topic in in other parts of the world, South Asia uh, and in the Near East mostly. Um, so this presentation will focus exactly on that. And um, I wanted to start with a little bit of a review as to what solar powered irrigation is. Um, here you see a, a, a picture, a diagram of, of a very classic typical system and what the difference is to those systems that were already installed in the late 70s and 80s is on one hand here you have the, the PV panels on number one the solar generator and uh, you see how much the prices have dropped since 2008-2009 um, which is one of the game changers uh, in the last sort of the last 10 years um, making solar powered irrigation much more affordable than they were before so that's one point and the other aspect that changed is um, I mean there is some innovation around here point two mounting structure in the sense that we have trackers that make things more efficient but also more costly and harder to maintain and the other big change is number three the controller um, that's sort of what it looks like what it can look like um, and the controller enables a more steady inflow of energy, uh, which means that the pump has a much more steady supply of energy, which is greater for its efficiency. And so even if there's clouds and irregularities and then sort of the irradiation that goes through the PV panels, um, the energy supply can, make, can be maintained relatively steadily. And that's a great improvement in terms of efficiency of the pumps. And that makes it again more interesting to in compared to the systems that used to exist in the in the eighties or so forth. Um, and then what else, what else constitutes a system is on one hand um, you might have a monitoring system and um, number six you have a water tank and the water tank uh, is optional you don't need it but it's a way of say, of storing water for example during night or during uh, dry periods or on really cloudy days um, that enables you to have water even though the sun might not shine at that time. Um, it can also be a water pond or a larger reservoir. Uh, this is more symbolic for water storage. And then, of course, and that's part of it, so you then can have um, a fertigation system or a filtration system, depending on the water quality, and the irrigation distribution system. That is crucial. So lo normally low pressure systems work very well in solar powered irrigation and um, or you have a direct application onto the field so that's what it is when we talk about solar powered irrigation it's not that complicated but there are some tricky things that that um, we need to be aware of um, and so why are we so it's quite a hot topic people are quite interested in in solar powered irrigation and so the idea was okay why is it good and obviously we have no emissions during uh, operation. It is really relatively reliable, especially with the improvements that I talked about in the controlling system. And it, it can be very affordable, particularly when we look at um, very high electricity costs um, or diesel, Bhutan, other, other costs, or a very unreliable system that keeps cutting out. And, um, and at the same time, it helps as was mentioned in the introduction, to reach to particularly remote areas. Um, SPIS is often used in, in humanitarian contexts. Maybe the speaker later on can tell us a bit also in the, in the, in the in, for example, in, in mountainous areas where it's very hard to build a grid. Um, so in that sense, it can help the electrification in, in, in rural and remote areas. Um, I already mentioned sort of an independence from the from the from the energy from the commercial or from the conventional energy supply system, and you have a reduction of costs because what you have is a relatively high investment costs in the beginning, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, 
but also no more costs during the operations be beyond a certain probably for maintenance a little uh, expense uh, so it makes it cheaper and uh, with that you can access water in agriculture and that can help you for so you can use that water either to achieve more optimal harvests or diversify your production system so those are all very good reasons for solar power irrigation what we do draw attention to is that there is also an impact on water resources because if you don't have an energy cost anymore that uh, regulates extraction um, in a way you have energy as long as the sun shines and you can pump as much as you want so there is a risk that as more as, as there's more and more use of groundwater that you have an over abstraction of 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 groundwater and that can cause severe environmental problems and socioeconomic problems later on um, another issue is that through subsidies and um, uh, sort of uh, other financial incentives, you may it may not be competitive to have solar irrigation. So there's also that aspect that the market may be distor distorted. And finally, it does require I mentioned the big, larger, relatively larger capital investment at the beginning. It requires access to finance, particularly for smallholders, if this is supposed to be equitable. And the same goes for the know-how and the access to maintenance and repair services because there may be some tricky aspects that uh, you know not, and the, the, the average farmer may not be able to tackle without training and that has happened a few times in the sense that if a system fails then there is a strong skepticism and a distrust of um, um, uh, in the technology itself good um, I want to touch on three areas of, of that make this topic quite exciting um, one of them is financing so this is really about what can happen in a space when you don't just look so uh, for solar irrigation to work particularly for the smallholder that can't afford a front up payment um, there needs to be some sort of way of accessing financing and what's exciting about it is that more and more uh, products are developing that can be done either through um, partnerships of, sort of conventional banks um, that are working with uh, pump providers or manufacturers to give out specific loans for solar powered irrigation. There are some interesting examples of that in, in Tunisia or here in Kenya. Um, then microfinance institutes that are developing particular products directed uh, directed at irrigation which is an area that they usually were quite conscious of because of you know the risks involved with it um, there's interesting leasing models now where over time you pay off the the, uh, the cost and eventually the ownership gets transferred and another aspect is our value chain loans so either the tech company gives a loan to the farmer sort of how car companies do it sometimes and that gets paid off or even further downstream on the value chain when you have often usually larger uh, wholesalers or or larger companies that either want to uh, either following a CSR policy or a greening or sort of to get a certain certification invest in and give loans along the to to, to producers to change uh, production patterns and then there are models along pay as you go uh, particularly in countries where there's mobile money this is interesting because you can pay up front for either of service so either a certain amount of energy or a certain amount of volume of water pumped um, either through your phone or some systems have scratch cards that you can buy um, and then you have we have interesting saving systems in cooperatives and informal groups as well. And this is exciting because these are all new things that are coming up. And at the same time, it links to business models because it's not about necessarily owning a pump, but it's about either renting it or sharing it among a group. And so there's interesting ways of, of, of engaging with that. Um, the other area is the design. I mentioned some things around the, the controller, the 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 um, um, making sure that you have that you know your water requirements and then therefore design the pump in a way that you 
have different options of storing water. Um, and then there's also other things like mobile uh, panels or floating panels, as you can see down here in the corner. Um, and the other thing that is happening more and more is that because these pumps have groundwater metering and other data and often our um, suppliers are even doing soil tests and are willing to install soil moisture sensors that you collect, you start to collect a, a certain amount of data that uh, you can fit into, feed into IoT platforms and Perhaps it's not, I mean, I'm speaking here also from the Kenyan context where there's a lot of uh, mobile applications, but there are interesting ways, uh, interesting developments towards developing sort of smart agricultural systems, um, also with the help of these pumps. Um, and then the final area that I was just wanting to touch on is uh, the idea of multiple users, so that you use the system in either the water or the energy, not just for this one purpose of irrigation, but for multiple users. So either livestock watering um, or, or sort of domestic users um, for the water, but also on the energy side for electrical appliances, for other um, productive uses on farm. Or for example, here there's a picture of a pivot system that is being run through solar. Um, and and the idea a little bit what i like about it is that the farmer it's, uh, him herself can make a rational choice how the energy is supposed to be used so um it's not just for the water pumping but you may want to use it to for cold storage or for husking of rice and so um when you have these systems the, it's no longer just, and I mentioned the water issue before, it's no longer just about the water extraction, but it's about the, using the energy in different ways. And that, or the water as well, um, and that can have a very meaningful impact on how water is being extracted. And that's certainly something to look into. Unfortunately, um, it's there's not that many systems designed truly for multiple use. So it's really, um, it's something I can give some examples as to, you know, what kind of technologies they sort of developed. And then there are some, some developments in the mini grid sector, but uh, this is still sort of coming, coming up. Um, and then, yeah, so the final thing I wanted to talk about, I think my time might run out soon. Um, the final thing is uh, something that we've worked on in my project with GIZ is the toolbox on solar powered irrigation, which sort of tries to capture all these topics um, in a sort of comprehensive way. Um, and we developed um, modules. So this is more like a guide through these different topics, as you can see here, get informed, promote and initiate, safeguard water, invest, finance, design, uh, set up, irrigate and maintain. Um, and there's tools as well. You can access it online. It's for free. Everyone can contribute to it. And um, generally, the content of the of the toolbox looks like sort of the preconditions. So this is the get informed and a safeguard water. What is it that makes solar powered irrigation suitable, feasible in a certain context. Um, it looks at the planning stages. So on one hand, sort of the, the market setting, the suppliers that are existing, etc., but also the design of the system. Then the economics of it. Um, oh, I didn't come up now. Um, the economics of it is sort of the, does it make sense for me as a farmer to invest? And also what access do I have to what kind of financial product and what are the criteria for that? And then also the fourth point, uh, management, um, where you, where it's more about the setup, the irrigation system and, the, and, and, and how you irrigate and the maintenance of the system. So all of this is covered in the toolbox. There's different tools, some are Excel based, some are more complicated, some are more checklists, um, but there's a lot, a lot of information there. And so just wanna put the word out that um, there is this toolbox. Uh, here's a link and a QR code if you're interested in accessing it, uh, because it touches on a lot of the things that I mentioned just now. So with that, I am finished, and uh, I hope uh, almost in time. Yeah, just ran a little bit over, but that's fine. This okay, is sorry. Information <laughs> with those um, solar irrigation tools, so we'll be sure to to have that posted so others others can see as well. Um, but yes, thank you so much. Very interesting topics there. 
So we will now be moving to our second presenter, who is Pooja Sharma, uh, who is with the Practical Action, and she's in Nepal. So Pooja, are you there? Yes, Jessica. All right, well then I'm handing it over to you. Project. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, good evening, everyone from Nepal. Uh, it is my pleasure to be speaking in this uh, webinar. I would uh, like to start my presentation with these uh, pictures where you can see that people uh, are living in the area who are like very close to water, but unable to use it and benefit from it. Uh, it is actually similar to the situation where you know uh, people live in dark and electricity power lines are run by their houses or above their head. Uh, this is an interesting picture. I like this picture because uh, you can see uh, there is a good resort here and within uh, an aerial distance of maybe like two kilometers there lives communities uh, who do not have access to uh, water and who lives in very different conditions. Uh, to talk about uh, the context in Nepal, uh, almost you know, uh, 2 million farmers in Nepal suffer from poor yields uh, as they rely on rain for irrigation. And also, if you talk about electricity access, 20% of people still do not have access to a reliable and quality supply. And then uh, talking about the uh, sectoral consumption, actually, uh, of electricity, uh, majority of the consumption is in the residential sector, and that's for lighting. And electric electricity consumption is among the lowest in agriculture. So renewable energy has uh, so much significance, as you have seen uh, or heard from earlier presenters as well. And it can contribute to different sectors, uh, mainly agriculture. Uh, there has been uh, like uh, many doable business models uh, that works for big farmers, but having right business model uh, that works for smallholder farmers in Nepal is uh, challenging. So with this in mind, uh, we developed a project which was supported by Visions, uh, where our motivation was to demonstrate viability of impact financing and rent to own model for increased production and income of farmers uh, and then also learn like what works and what doesn't work in these kind of partnerships and inspire for upscaling and influencing purpose, policy influencing purpose. So uh, what was the business model? It is uh, basically solar powered water lifting for irrigation. Um, Lucy had presented uh, all the technologies about it. So good for me. Uh, I'll be talking about the business models and the partnerships. Uh, it's basically a partnership between uh, NGO, which is uh, Practical Action, uh, and later we had RERL, uh, and uh, local cooperative, Sun Farmer, which is a impact financer, and then farmers who are basically uh, beneficiaries at the moment. So uh, from the vision support, Practical Action input was uh, a grant to, uh, to the farmers where uh, our investment included cost of training, social mobilization, community engagement, and knowledge dissemination. Uh, and then Sun Farmers investment was uh, on loan to the uh, solar systems together with the uh, performance guarantee of the technology. So they were the, and they are the technology provider along with uh, providing guarantees to the, uh, to the technologies. Uh, from the farmers, there was an equity investment um, so what was new in this uh, business model is in the earlier business models, uh, the business model was limited up to the uh, up to the earlier stage, meaning up to here. But we were not only uh, working with the sun, sun, flower, sun farmer on the supply side of the solar uh, pumps, but also we were working with the farmers on the agriculture farmer uh, value chain. So uh, the water, the farmers would get water from the solar powered uh, water lifting system, and then they would be using the water for the commercial vegetable farming. So our inputs was basically to uh, train farmers on the commercial vegetable farming to provide linkages or to facilitate linkages between the farmers and the market uh, so that 
you know, the income of the farmers would increase and in return, they would be able to pay back to the uh, to Sun Farmer on equal monthly installment. Uh, the idea, the other idea is after the five years of time, the Sun Farmer would lend the system to uh, to the farmers and farmers would be operating and managing their systems. Uh, looking at the investment ratio, it is 55% uh, uh, as a grant. This actually, when we started, it was 20% grant because, but unfortunately, we had an earthquake in Nepal, and then there was a market distortion. Everything was provided on free, so we had to add do uh, some additional investment. Uh, th there are some pictures where you can see uh, the systems and also uh, female represented government representative. Uh, talking about the business model and you know uh, trying to include this in their upcoming uh, energy plans. Uh, some stories from the farmers uh, where you can see that, like farmers were doing uh, traditional farming and maize one time crop but now they are doing three times uh, vegetable farming. Uh, if you uh, ask me about the key features, I would say uh, the, ma the major thing is about the affordability, like uh, farmers are able to pay it at monthly installment. Knowledge has been transferred and then will be transferred to the locals uh, from the sun farmers. Uh, compared to the grid electricity, yes, it's more reliable and quality is maintained. Risk mitigation provisions are there through insurance and then impact financing because uh, farmers do not have to, do not have to pay it uh, upfront. Also, we had uh, participatory planning and engagement, so uh, it's really based on the uh, needs of the farmers. Uh, in the end, I would like to uh, uh, point out a few things. Uh, some of them were highlighted by Lucy. Uh, like one of the issues or what would we do differently in the future is maybe we would plan uh, more for underutilized water because in some of the uh, seasons where there is heavy rain, people would not need water and the system is idle in those uh, in those times. We'd also like to have uh, more digital technology so that we can really monitor and then see the impact of the uh, services that is provide that is uh, provided to the farmers uh, we'll also like to see uh, multiple use of water because there has been demand uh, from farmers about that also we are thinking about uh, a connection to the grid uh, could be another option to be you know to enable farmers to have more incomes uh, the last thing which we would like to see explore more is about you know uh, using the existing structures such as maybe using agriculture cooperatives and then developing them as energy service providers or energy service companies in uh, in future. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, um, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all and also uh, take the opportunity. Uh, to provide you a link uh, to our flagship publication, Poor People's Energy Outlook. The 2018 edition is about delivering inclusive ac energy access at scale. I hope uh, you will also like our editions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Luna, for sharing your experiences in Nepal. Uh, it's lovely to uh, see and, and hear more about that. So wonderful. Um, thank you, guys. So this is a reminder that the questions that you guys are posting on the side uh, will be answered, uh, you know, when we begin the discussion. Uh, so make sure that you are addressing those questions and please just make sure you write uh, who the question is directed to. All right, so now we're moving on to our third presenter, who is Jorge Ayarza. He will be sharing his experiences with Min Mayu and uh, Wind Empowerment there in India, uh, more about the hybrid systems and different projects that he has going on there. All right, Jorge, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, well then, thank you for joining us. And I will hand it thank over you. to you now. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, everybody can hear me? Um, okay, one second. So it, we're working with um, Visions and also uh, 500 RPM, which is based in Argentina. Uh, our organization here in India is called Mean Bayou. Um, and uh, Wind Empowerment is uh, the main organization that we work with. And um, 
the, our work here is different. It's uh, actually based on uh, water pumping, but mostly wind, wind water pumping. Um, just to uh, give a background on India, um, the, there's a huge market for diesel replacement. Um, uh, uh, essentially, the government is planning on or trying to do some uh, replacement of uh, uh, systems mostly with solar water pumping. Um, and uh, those are some numbers there to have a, an idea of what the size of the market is over here. Um, and um, essentially, when, uh, when we talk about uh, water pumping, we're talking about two types of systems. Uh, we're talking about a wind turbine running a pump directly uh, the advantage with the wind turbine running the pump directly is we're talking about a standard three-phase pump. Uh, so it's not a special DC pump or anything like that. And also we don't need any special controller. So actually the technology is quite simple. Uh, so uh, we are doing a, a system that we're running here. It's with a 2 and 3 HP horsepower pump. Um, and uh, the other system that's been developed mostly in Argentina is a hybrid system. It's wind and solar direct connected pump. In this case, we do have a special controller connecting both systems. Uh, the special controller is called the on wall uh, controller. And it's uh, a wind empowerment is developing this uh, around the country. And, uh, so. The, sorry, the on wall uh, system is uh, being tested in Argentina. Here are uh, some of the guys that are doing this work. And uh, uh, the idea is uh, this is the original design was the first controller was a proprietary system. The new system is actually a system that is um, an open source design, meaning that uh, anybody can uh, build it, anybody can modify it. It can be a system that can uh, can be basically built and used worldwide and built locally. Um, this is an example of our uh, 3HP system. This is actually a test bench. So this is the system that we're testing. We're uh, we test it using a motor, so obviously this is not a wind turbine that's up on the tower, but it's actually the system that we test with and connect to a pump and uh, be able to see the efficiency of the system. Um, uh, by the way, the, as you can see, they look a little bit different, but this is the generator, and uh, these are all homemade systems. So the principle of the project is you should be able to make all this equipment locally. So um, this is how we approach the, you could say, the sustain sustainability of the system, meaning you can train people on how to build the systems, and then you can uh, actually be able to um, a, have a micro, uh, or um, not a micro loan program, but a micro manufacturing program where you can train Seems like we're losing you, Jorge. Are you still there? Yes, we have had some troubles with Jorge co um, communication. Um, yeah, we can try to probably to go further and I, I'm sure she, he will he will connect again Jessica and we can try to 
to resume a bit his his uh, presentation yeah yeah we'll we'll resume with with Jorge once we're able to get him back um he might have lost his connection i know that sometimes he's in he's in an, here he's in a remote area so it might be a little bit hard sometimes but so while we wait for him uh i suppose we can go on with the discussion. I know we've been having a few questions coming in uh, for Lucy and for Pooja as well. So maybe we can just uh, get rolling with with some of those questions. Um, in the meantime, while we hear back from Jorge, we can bring him back. So, uh, We'll start here quickly with the first question, uh, question to Lucy. Um, so for each farmer, the value proposition of renewal based irrigation is strongly, strongly related to his or her linkages to food markets. How important is to consider those downstream processes of local food value chains when promoting renewable energy based irrigation? Lucy, are you there? I think we might have we we might have you on mute there, Lucy. Let's see. Okay, now it works. Oh, <laughs> I was go. just yeah, I was just muted from the other side. <laughs> Couldn't unmute. Good. Um. Yes, absolutely. Um. I think what we're trying to say with with the work that we're doing is that uh, we we don't want to rely on subsidies and it has to make financial sense to invest in such a system. So one aspect is, does it make sense for me to invest in um, uh, in in solar versus diesel versus electricity grid versus other things and then the other aspect is of course looking at the farm so what are my incomes so let's say i'm harvesting tomatoes and i have a market for that and i have some cattle and some milk and some eggs from the chicken um what is it how is it enough so i do i have a large enough profit margin if i have access to the market already uh, to afford it and then also what opportunities do i have to diversify my production to um so if i make an investment into such an irrigation system what do do i have any opportunities to have a second harvest change my crops to higher value crops to expand my land my irrigated land um, to have more cattle that i can water um, so these are all aspects that are that that we're also looking at in the toolbox you have for example the farm analysis tool where that is very much a topic um, where it's all about okay in my context as a farmer, what can I, what value can I get from from the pump? And um, of course, yeah, it's market access. It's like where do I sell my my food, uh, my crops, and also it's about at what price. So that all plays in. Um, but that's that's yeah, <laughs> that is that is a key aspect to consider. But I think most importantly, it's about how, what can you do on the farm? How do you develop there? Great, thank you so much for answering that, Lucy. I know that um, maybe for a follow up, it would be um, a question from the the audience was, uh, what about those farmers that are living in villages that they don't know about this technology, perhaps how to um, better inform them about this technology? Yes, I mean, I mean, when we talk about market access, then we already assume that there is a uh, uh, you know, that, that they're not the poorest of the poorest and that they that they have uh, already some sort of information flow as well and and when you go to the markets you you also um, you know you you have the potential to market your 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 um, produce when you talk about subsistence farming that's a bit uh, then then the different 
different, then maybe such an analysis isn't holding true. Um, how do you inform farmers of systems? That's that's um, a good challenge. Uh, so here in Kenya, we work with a lot of uh, with some technology manufacturers and suppliers, and they really are working on. Um, having people in the different counties, making sure that you have a service guarantee of being able to be reached by your service provider within two, two days. Um, and, and they're really trying to have this, this uh, really reaching out into the areas and having staff locally there. Um, I know that this is not at all the thinking in, in other countries uh, where you know you don't want to pay for services or the demand is for the government to provide extension services and, and advice on, on SPIS and these sort of things. So it's very, it's very context specific, I think, as well, the answer. Um, I know of, of of a lot of different like startups and, and NGOs and, 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 and organizations that are doing work around awareness raising and resensitization, but a lot of it has to do with being able to access, first of all, the suppliers and then the install, and installers and then the maintenance services. And uh, I think that's actually the starting point for making for 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 spreading the technology. And it, it can be, just to say that, it can be differently sized. So you have very simple, basic, like uh, cheap pumps, uh, affordable pumps is maybe a better word. And then you have very complex, bigger systems as well. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lucy, for answering those questions for us. It seems like we have Jorge back on the line. So we're going to try to get him in so he can um, finish his presentation for us. Um, Jorge, are you there? See if we can bring him back. I think you're on mute there, Jorge. And so that's an happy back here. Technical difficulties. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, Jorge. Thanks for okay. Sorry. Sorry for my uh, bad uh, connection. Anyway, um, I was talking about um, Maharashtra. The project site there is interesting because uh, we're using a uh, a BFD drive, which is a solar drive. And uh, this drive is actually a, a modification of the drive to run with both wind and solar. So this is our, um, this is our first uh, attempt at uh, doing this. And uh, it, the idea there is, um, uh, we should be able to transform any uh, solar system to a hybrid system. Um, and uh, this is a challenge because, of course, you have different manufacturers of different systems, but the idea is it should be technology agnostic, meaning we should be able to do it on anything, any, any EFD drive on the market. Um, but this requires more work. Uh, the first tests were quite interesting, except that it wouldn't work at night, which is obviously not good, because <laughs> it was mostly windy at night. Um, but uh, the idea is uh, we should be able to modify those things further on. Um, the second system is in Telangana, and it's a wind-only system. It's a 3HP uh, system. And the, the interesting thing there is that we were trying to use a, they already had a BFD drive and they already had a solar system. But the issue there is um, the, in monsoon time, it, the, it was cloudy but with no rain. So the, the solar system was not working uh, at all. Uh, so uh, even though they had a lot of wind, 
uh, at that time in the monsoon season, they could not use it. So we installed the wind system there. Um, as I say, we when we say we installed the wind system, we went and we built with the community a wind system. And so they learned how to build the system, they learn how to maintain it. Um, and in their case in particular, what was interesting is they had a lot of productive applications that we can actually add on to. So carpentry shop, oil extraction, um, drill press, different type of machinery that can run directly without the use of a battery bank. Um, so those are the types of applications that we're really interested in developing. Um, then the, finally, the third uh, site is in Argentina. Uh, they had a test site in the south of Argentina and also in Buenos Aires where, the, where they're located, the, the main office. Um, and uh, what happened is the first controller was developed, uh, but it was prepared to controller. So the idea is to develop through uh, wind empowerment the own wall controller, is, which is an open source controller. And the nice thing about developing an open source controller is you are no longer uh, linked to um, one person uh, to sell you the system, but we are able to, once it's fully developed, be able to offer this as a product that can be built by anyone, anywhere, after they get trained um, on how to build it. So uh, this is the beauty of the open source system. Yeah. Uh, so the update for us here in India is we have had three years of drought at the project site, which is, as I said, the, uh, one of the driest places in India, and the uh, wells are drying, including at the project site. So um, we did, obviously, uh, interviews in, uh, with uh, different farmers in the region, in the area, and uh, you learn, we learned a lot uh, with regard to the issues that they're facing. Um, and uh, the issue here is uh, they couldn't use the PV system, so they asked us to install the, the wind system. So we, we did that. Um, and, uh, but it's no use if there's no water. Um, so this is a big challenge. Um, then the, uh, the issue with the uh, hybrid systems and the solar systems, uh, in the, in the case of solar, mostly in India, maybe in other places not the same. I don't know how it's in Kenya, but uh, here they uh, they use a solar system and they don't store the water, but they just uh, irrigate uh, at the time of pumping. And uh, there's an issue with a high evaporation rate. Um, so we feel that uh, if you if you're in a dry area, um, then it's uh, it's actually best to be able to a pump at night, um, so there's less evaporation. Um, a, but the main issue is uh, the the fact that uh, you need to have uh, decent water management. Uh, in a dry area, it's the water management is not only of the individual but of, in the whole region. Um, so we feel that the number one thing is how to save water. This is like, uh, this should be like the design imperative and the designing of the system. Um, so obviously developing uh, smart controllers, uh, being able to measure water flow. A, I was happy to hear that in uh, Kenya, they're having uh, very advanced uh, or very intelligent water pumping systems. So it would be great to learn more about those. A, but uh, I feel that um, Successful projects are not one-off systems, but really a region-wide or bioregion. And this is especially true in India, where about 60% of the water um, is from groundwater. And, uh, and uh, basically the rate of pumping has been higher than the rainfall. So you're just drying everything up. You know, it's a big sponge and it's just drying up. So, uh, so anyway, the follow-up, uh, basically the what we feel is the we need to manage the renewable energy or the energy that you have available, but you need to actually manage the water, water off it, um, limit the water use. And the, uh, there's some optimization software, CropWatt from FAO. I mean, 
I'm sure maybe the work that's being done in Kenya also has some of this. It's, uh, I think, uh, uh, farmers themselves don't really have the technical know-how, so there, there really needs to be a lot of uh, training. And uh, I feel probably all over the world, but here in India especially, the farmers are really unaware, uh, truly, of the impact that they're having with the overpumping that's happening. One of the one of the main problems in India is uh, uh, farmers get free electricity from the grid, uh, and uh, that had made it, made made it a custom uh, practice for them to simply uh, turn on the pump and forget about it. So uh, they're used to just using a lot of water. And uh, so they're used to, if you have a grid connection, uh, not all farmers have a grid connection, by the way, but uh, if you have, if you're lucky enough to have a grid connection, uh, then you have, and you're not paying for electricity, there's no value in the water either. Yeah. So uh, this is a very, very big uh, issue. And it's, uh, it's uh, an issue that's a big problem because it's a political issue also. It, the other issue I see is um, there's also a issue, there's a problem where the, the crops that are uh, not water intensive, that are maybe uh, not a, that they end up not being exactly the most commercial uh, crops. So the low, uh, the crops that are drought resistant, uh, millets, for example, um, in a traditional sense, millets were pre uh, prevalent here in India a lot, uh, 50 years ago, but nowadays everybody's just planting rice and sugarcane, uh, which are high water intensive crops. Um, and uh, there seems to be a disconnect between a, a, the market, the resource, and the income. Um, so the, this is something that needs to be looked on, and uh, I, I believe that there should be ways of uh, uh, improving this. Uh, you go to farmers, and the, the farmers, you talk to them about what they're planting, and then why don't you plant the other crop? And they say, well, who do I sell it to? So there's an issue, an issue with the market. Um, that's it. All right. <laughs> Yeah, can you put up your information so people can reach out to you uh, if yeah. you have more questions? Thank you so much for that, Jorge. I know that we had a little glitch there, but people can connect to you. Sorry. Uh, and now, yeah, yes. no worries. Thank you so much. And we are now, um, we have wrapped up all the presenters that we had for today. We're going to pull up here a quick uh, last poll before we can dive in into our discussion, which is going to be cut a little bit short for you guys um, today, but we'll be sure to answer a few questions that have been uh, sent to us. So here's the poll, the poll that we'd like to answer. What rele relevance is global energy to having your current profession? I kind of like to know that. we we'll give here a few minutes to answer this question um, so we can get a better idea of how this is embedded within your profession currently. All right, so we will wrap up this poll here to get the answers and then get moving into our discussion. All right, so yeah, so it's, it's quite relevant to to uh, um, more than half of the people, so that's that's great to know. So thank you all for answering these polls and for partaking in in providing us live feedback. And so now uh, we're definitely going to be moving into this discussion. I do see a couple questions that we have from the audience. Um, so uh, we we've already had some questions for Lucy. So thank you, Lucy, for answering those questions. Um, so we like to ask a question to Pooja, if you're still there, we can unmute you. Yes. There you are, there. So the question for you, Pooja, is 
what has been the role of women farmers in the delivery model that you have been applying? Is there uh, a particular challenging issue there in Nepal uh, in the context for gender sensitivity approach? And what are some lessons uh, for, for dealing with these challenges? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, practical action actually uh, follows gender transformative approach in whatever uh, interventions we do, which means uh, the shared control of resources and decision making. Uh, so the idea in this project is also to have women in decision making committee. Um, actually, we just you know, um, just don't look at uh, men and women issues, but also we dive more into the details and then uh, talk about men and women with diversities and intersectionalities. You know, there would be very different needs if you go and analyze uh, these issues. Uh, so we we our every intervention is followed on uh, is followed on these approaches. Uh, we also do have uh, safeguarding policies and grievance mechanisms. So we ensure uh, participation of women in meetings are safe. You know, uh, we consider time that is suitable for these uh, groups. Uh, we also think about appropriate seating arrangements when we are. Uh, having women farmers in the meetings because most of the times male are like men are sitting in the chairs and women are sitting in the ground so you know that also makes a difference and also uh, maybe higher caste people are sitting in the chair and low caste people are sitting in the ground so uh, people are not really engaged uh, uh, engaged actively uh, in this particular cases or projects uh, efforts were made uh, to have participation from all the levels uh, of society in a meaningful way. Uh, when there were multi-stakeholder meetings, we included civil societies of women, ethnic groups, women re representatives from governments, and even like te technicians and engineers from Sun Pharma were women, you know, to let them know that these technologies are women friendly or these are not very dangerous technologies. Uh, so these kind of initiatives were taken. And basically women are not uh, just considered or were not just considered as the as beneficiaries. Rather, they were engaged in the management committee, in the decision making process. And actually, they have been the change leaders now. And they try they tell their stories to other communities and try to inspire other people as well. Uh, when I say these thoughts, you know, people think that these are small things, but uh, we do not know that if we put effort on this in the beginning, this can actually lead to bigger, bigger changes in the in the long run. Um, there have been cases, not in this particular project, but in other projects where we have worked with the cooperatives and financial institutions to develop uh, financial products that are affordable for men and women uh, with different diversities and intersectionalities. Um, so yeah, these are, these are the kind of uh, interventions uh, we've been doing uh, to deal the challenges uh, that these people have. Thank you, thank you, Pooja. Yeah, that's, that's uh, quite interesting there. So the next question that we have is actually for Lucy. Um, so Lucy, the question that was um, sent to us was, how has system security improved to reduce the chances of the pumping system from being stolen, since in most cases the system has to be fitted in a remote location away from a household? So this is a question for you. Lucy, are you there? I am. Um, yeah, it's... Uh... Safety and theft and vandalism is always a challenge. Eh? I'm, I mean, there is no real one fix all. Uh, we advise to set up the panels relatively high, so they are mounted quite high up. Um, if possible, that helps, then you can't reach them so easily. Um, things like the, the pump and the controller can be fenced in or locked away. Um, I've seen systems even in Rwanda where it was worth hiring a uh, guard, a security guard that would watch over them <laughs> at night. Um, there's also foldable systems where you can take the panels at least um, to your house or mobile systems where they are on, on wheels 
or trolleys. Uh, so you can even move them and, and that's also quite interesting because you can move them from one place to another. Um, if you if you share a pumping system uh, like a like a PV system in that case uh, with other people, um, or if you have multiple pumps, um, so there's different ways of how to deal with the with the theft. Um, but there's there's in in the design itself there's not really anything that that addresses it. But there's ways in how you can install it that that can make it safer. Thank you. Yes, that that does. So see, thank you. Here we have another question here for Pooja, actually. So Pooja, uh, it says, you mentioned that you are considering connection of the water pumps to the grid. What model of pumps are you considering for this? And is there a significant justification that income will increase with this intervention? Pooja, are you there? Later. Hello. Oh, there you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, I mean, we have not looked a, in details about the uh, model of the pumps yet, but what we have seen is uh, whether there is an enabling environment or whether there would be an incentive to connect to the grid uh, or not. So uh, recently there is there has been policy revisions and there is a provision of integration or synchronizing these energies, renewable energies, into the grid, and it it will definitely help farmers to earn more uh, from the uh, power purchase agreement that they will be having with the utility, rather than uh, having their systems idle for uh, like uh, sit for uh, three or four months uh, without using it. And then Jorge, are you still there? We have a question for you from the audience. Can you hear me? Yeah. So the question for Jorge is: Are the high star, st high stator voltage motors, uh, are they also one in Argentina or manufactured by a current manufacturer in India or Argentina, for that matter? Jorge, are you there? That we've lost Jorge for a little bit again here. So we'll bring him back. So uh, I know we have uh, we're we're closing up these this webinar series. Uh, we really appreciate all of our panelists for coming out today and um, providing uh, all of this useful information with uh, the technologies that they're using for irrigation. Uh, it's, been, it's been a great pleasure to, to be here with you guys. Um, we'll definitely have the recording available of this webinar on the website. Um, I know that some of you guys from the audience have mentioned uh, there have been, been losing connection or whatnot. So you can make sure to obtain this recording online on the web on the Wishins uh, website, um, and then their contact information of our presenters will also be available there for you. So we can certainly uh, make that connection with you guys, and, and you can further ask them questions. Um, so as we wrap up this webinar, we'd like to thank uh, our panelists again, Lucy uh, Push. Pooja Sharma and Jorge Ayarza once again and we will be uh, sending you this short survey uh, where you can help us improve uh, for the next time or you can suggest any other topics that you'd like to hear uh, here in the Wishes webinar um, so please take So have a good day. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye. Thank you.
thank you. Yeah, thank you all of you for the great these ideas. Bye bye. <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.